to implement and manage organic um, composting on a community level. So this is basically what we're trying to achieve when we are doing community composting, that we are closing the loop. Waste, food and garden waste is taken and composted right in the community where it's created and it goes back into the soil to grow wonderful fruit and vegetables for, for us to eat, um, keep us healthy. Um, we want to actually look after our soils. Our soils are being depleted and we need to think about how we can restore those nutrients to our soils so that we can have sustainable uh, food security for our communities. This poster really gives a lot of information on how compost actually benefits the soil um, and, and helps us um, make a, a sustainable world for ourselves. So community composting is actually quite widespread in America and Canada. Um, this, for example, is Earth Matters in New York City on, on an island just outside the, the main city. And you can see here, these are the um, yellow and black coats are what they use to collect food waste from um, households. They are using um, a covered windrows. Um, also have a very nice um, a trommel sieve here at the back. And these community sites normally use um, volunteers, but they also have a lot of government support funding for these uh, initiatives. So they are really quite widespread. Um, they might be big like this one, or you could have a very simple, um, small scale composting site where material is re received, uh, mixed and put into bins, and then used in a garden or, or sold for the benefit of the garden. So when we talk about composting, there really is some important questions you need to ask. And that is how the initiative will serve and include the local community. Unfortunately, composting um, sometimes has negative connotations. You need to uh, look at how it will be received by the, the neighbours of the composting site. You need to look at things like how you're going to create a visual screen between you and your neighbours. Is there going to be machinery that you're going to be using that can cause a nuisance? And you've also got to take into the fact that composting will cause odours and how you're going to manage those odours so it doesn't become a nuisance. That's really important to look at before you start. When you're looking at setting something up, you need to look at your goals, the team that is going to use to implement the composting um, system, and then also your methods. And training is so important when it comes to composting. So it's important to uh, identify compost mentors and resources and look at the laws and regulations that will apply to your operation and try and understand those. I'm going to look at five steps to start uh, your composting. You want to look at your site, layout is important, as well as your wind direction when it comes to odours. Water is also very important to understand and look at your access and security. A management plan of who will do what, um, the role of volunteers and employees of, of, a, of a composting facility. You want to be able to choose your composting system, the right one for your site, and your systems, and then you'll need to have the tools to implement. And then finally, to select, collect, and manage your feedstock. So as far as your site goes, this is a, a basic site plan where you basically have raw and unstable material coming in on the left-hand side to a receiving area. It then goes into actively managed compost piles, and then it is cured and stored once it's stable. You never want to mix stable material with unstable material. Once it's stable, then it can be sold or used in the garden. So there's a flow through the compost site where you, you are separating these two materials. You can have on the right hand side, you'll see oh, there's a berm that can protect the site that's on a slope from a rainwater running onto the site. And on the left hand side, you'll see there's a filter strip or swale which can protect the ground and uh, surface water from any runoff from the site. Your ideal surface for a composting um, area is concrete and hopefully concrete that somebody else paid for. So that's very important. Here you have a small scale composting site where you have a bin for um, placing a food waste in so households can bring the food and put it into the bin. It then flows on into the left into these composting bins 
where it's composted and then stored in the in the back bin here for use in the garden. So a distinct separation between fresh material and mature material. There are many compost systems you can choose from. Um, first is turned windows. You can have system aerated uh, static piles or passively aerated static piles in vessel systems. Static piles, which are piles that are neither turned nor aerated, and then also vermicomposting systems. So looking at your site and your systems, you need to choose the correct compost system for your situation. Here are some examples of some composting facilities. This one is in New York City on the right hand side under the Queensboro Bridge. I've actually visited the site and they use a Gore-Tex cover for um, aeration. And, um, they um, have a, a very good um, system there to control odors because they're very close to a residential area. Um, and then on the left-hand side, you can actually see um, they've got a, a fan that blows air into horizontal pipes under, uh, under the compost. And these are all fairly small-scale systems. On the right hand side in this one is a vessel system. It's an earth tub. It has a vertical auger as well as a fan that um, composts the food and garden waste. Um, it's completely contained and it, you need to plug it into an electrical system to make this work. On the left hand side, you have pre-mixed materials being put into uh, compost bins um, for contained uh, composting on a small scale site. These are some examples of composting systems. You'll need tools for your composting and very important is a temperature probe to check the temperatures of the compost to make sure you're getting sterilization temperatures. And it's also very important to monitor and record the waste that you are busy composting. I really feel it's important to reflect how much waste is being processed in true community composting to prove to municipalities that Energy composting is a viable method of, of diverting organic waste from landfill. So keeping records is very helpful. Um, water source is important because you need to water your heat. You can use fresh water or you can use grey water um, to make sure the moisture levels are maintained within the compost heaps. Um, at the end of the process, you'll also need to have um, a sieve. Very easy to make DIY sieves or screens. You screen out large woody pieces of material and um, you have a nice product that you can either sell or use in the garden. This is a basic flow of composting. You basically, number one, collect and store your feedstocks. Um, you'll need to record those volumes of weights. If you've got very chunky feedstocks, you'll need to chop them up or trip them, and then you'll mix them together to build your compost pile. You'll need to record your temperatures and monitor the moisture levels as long as well as your odors. Um, checking to see if there's any problems is vital to make sure your compost moves um, through all the, the, the stages of composting. And finally, you'll let it cure for between six to 12 months is ideal before it's used in the garden or it's sold. Now, those are your basic steps of, of composting. When we're talking about window composting, this is how you build a window compost heap. You put a base of compost or carbon at the bottom, and then you put a mixture of green and brown material into the, into the middle, covered with a bio cover. This is old compost or a wood chip. You make sure all the food scraps are covered and you can control the odors. Very important that you make these heaps at least one cubic meter in size to make sure that you get those high temperatures in the middle of the heap. These are just uh, the tips of having successful composting. Uh, the chipping is important, um, helps you to make it easier to mix it. And then pre-mixing makes a nice mix of material that will get started with its composting right away. Um, moisture is so important in composting. A lot of people forget to, to uh, water the compost heaps and they tend to dry out and then they just stop composting. Um, that the adding of oxygen through turning or aeration pipes is also very important. And there are various systems of both vertical and horizontal systems that you can use. 
um, covering. I like to cover heat with either vinyl or plastic to make sure you don't lose too much moisture in the summertime and also you can contain odors. And the bio covers is vital for containing the, the odors within heaps, especially if you've got food waste in there. Right, our feedstocks. Um, these are the four ingredients you need for good compost. Green material, brown material, water and air. So green material is anything that's high in nitrogen. So those are things like your food scraps, um, um, glass cuttings and coffee grounds. Um, your brown material is high in carbon and that's leaves, wood chips, um, straw, paper. Um, when you do your mixing, you want to add um, one, one bucket of green material to two buckets of brown material. That's your ratio that you need to have those two mixed together. And then water is vital for the microbes to be activated so that they can uh, decompose the material in their compost heap. Again, air is vital for microbes, for them to, to, to work to break the material down. The garden waste, you have both green material and browns in garden waste. And grass cuttings can be very high in nitrogen and can actually be quite a big problem when it comes to odor. They must be properly managed. And then you have more brown material like leaves and prunings. A lot of people are unsure about whether they can add weeds to the compost. If you have high temperatures in your compost between 55 and 65 degrees, those weed seeds will be inactivated. So it's not a problem to put weeds that may contain seeds into a compost heap. Chipping in garden waste, it's always easier to turn waste that's been chipped. And you're also breaking down that surface area so it, um, it breaks down quicker. If you don't have a chipper, you can break up leaves using a lawn mower. So there are other ways besides a chipper to break up the material. You will see a lot of these kinds of posters on the internet about what can and what can't go into a compost heap. Now in my mind, anything that used to be alive can be composted. If you have a look on the right hand side under the no column, you'll see uh, cooked food, peas and dairy, meat and bones and oils and grease should not be composted. These materials are more challenging to compost. They can create odors and they can attract rodents. So what I would suggest is you start off with some of the simpler uh, materials like fruit and veg, coffee and egg, uh, tea bags and eggshells. Once you are confident that you are getting active heated compost heaps, then you can add the more challenging items. With regards to diseased plants and poisonous plants, again, high temperatures will destroy the diseases in the plants. And poisonous plants, if you're not eating the compost, you should be fine to add all types of plants to the compost. Um, on here, you also see that you can be composting pet waste. Uh, dog poo has salmonella and E. coli pathogens in it. Again, temperatures of 55 degrees will inactivate those bacteria. So again, you need to make sure that your composting system is sufficient um, to make sure that, that you destroy those pathogens. I definitely don't want to see plastic produce stickers. These are the stickers that are on fruit um, and, and labels, and those can contaminate your compost and go through a screen or sieve and end up in your final product. So those you want to make sure that they don't end up in your compost. And treated or painted wood, that has heavy metal chemicals in it. Never ever take pellet wood and chip it and put it into your compost. That's a definite no no, that's potentially harmful, and those heavy metals can accumulate in soils. So, yeah, so these lists you will often see in, in my mind, food waste includes everything, including meats and bones, dairy waste, seafood, cooked and uncooked food, onions and citrus. You just don't want any plastic, glass, or metal ending up in your compost heaps to contaminate. So here's an example of food waste going onto a pile of sawdust where it's about to be mixed uh, before it goes into a compost bin. Um, you can also use a layered system. Um, but mixing, it, mixing it definitely makes the compost faster. Other materials that you'll be expected to compost is compostable products, and you may see, have seen these coming through. Um, the first is the gas. It's a sugarcane byproduct. You can see it in the middle picture. Those products are used for plates and bowls and clamshells, normally for takeaways. Um, 
they often need to be soaked and shredded before you can compost them because if they dry out, they just won't compost at all. Um, you'll also see PLA um, lined coffee cups. PLA is polylactic acid and it's made from cornstarch. Um, and then also it's like a factory and cups. The thicker PLA will not compost on a small scale. You'll need an industrial scale compost site to, to compost those sites. And if you do see something that's marked octobiodegradable, they are definitely not compostable. They are have to have an enzyme in that will break the plastic up into microplastics and you'll contaminate your compost. So do not ever compost octobiodegradables. These products should all be certified compostable and they should be labeled with a conformity logo. If you can see on the right hand side, there's a seedling logo at the top and underneath is a registration number. This number can be checked against a database to make sure that that pro product is correctly certified compostable. Um, and there are several organizations that they do it. Um, EUV in Austria runs the database in Europe, and then PPI is the one that's in America. And it should also stipulate whether it's home compostable or industrial composting. So, for example, your eco cups, you may not have seen those, those are home compostable along with the gas product. Whereas your thicker PLA products have to be in an industrial composting facility um, because they are, they are quite thick and they need quite high heat to actually break down. Sourcing food stock, feedstocks, um, you need to decide what volume your community composting can cope with and what types of organic waste will be collected and which not. Are you going to do business or just residential food waste? Or are you going to provide collections or drop-offs or just a drop-off? Um, garden waste, are you going to get it from garden service companies or with households? Are you going to chip it or leave it unchipped? So these are the kind of decisions you need to make with regards to sourcing your feed. Can your facility um, handle 10 cubic meters of food waste or will you use a small scale bicycle system to collect buckets of food waste from households? Those are the kind of questions they need to understand. In these documents of best practices, there's a lot of information there that can help with setting up a community composting site. Um, troubleshooting tables for composting are really valuable if you're not um, getting anywhere with your composting. So they will actually look at the symptoms and give you the diagnosis of what the problem is. So for example, if your composting system is not heating up, there are several reasons why this can happen. It's too, the material's too dry, it's too wet, there's not enough nitrogen, there's poor structure or it's too cold and the pile is too small. Um, so then you can analyze what's going on. You look for other clues like you can't squeeze any water from the material. Um, it's obviously too dry. And then you can do the correct remedy to fix the problem to get your compost going again. So have a look on, on the main um, practices document. There's a, a there's a troubleshooting table for helping you with any problems with your composting. Another thing that's key that they do in Canada and America is they actually create community composter maps so that the public can identify where they can take their food and garden waste for composting. So it's a very simple way of finding out what services are available in different areas. I really think work needs to be done to, to map where these composting sites and um, urban gardens are that are busy processing um, organic waste. So this is a list of some composting sites in America. It's got their location and all the systems that they use. So everything from turn piles to windows to in vessel um, and some vermicompost. And then huge variation in the, the number of tons that they're doing per year. So from two tons a year to 21 tons a year. So there's huge variation on what can actually be handled at some of these sites. Sustainability is really important. And you'll see in some of the documents, they've got proper budgeting outlines for helping you understand some of the costs that can be involved. So in a lot of cases, these sites are run by volunteers with free resources. And perhaps you can have a system where people uh, swap hours of work in the garden for the privilege of bringing the food waste to or composting. And looking at partnerships with governments and businesses could also be beneficial. And then also considering if we're going to charge a gate fee and collection fee for processing the waste. So here are some of the cost estimates and you'll see there, a second from the bottom, is composting site tipping fees. 
So in America, they're charging between $25 and $55 a ton to process um, organic waste at composting sites. In Cape Town, the land for fees is currently between 500 and 700 rand a ton to process, uh, to, to, to dump at the landfill in Cape Town. Also in the, in the best practice misguide, there are lots of case studies of different community composting initiatives. So there's lots of advice and helpful ideas of how to establish and run these facilities. So go and have a look at those documents. In Cape Town, it does appear that the Department of Transport, Public Works, Agriculture and the City of Cape Town are promoting community gardens mainly for food security. And there is a card in the back, God, Godfrey Domingo at the City of Cape Town, who could possibly be of assistance in unlocking land and, and help from, from the municipality. But there doesn't seem to be a one-stop shop of how to apply for land or get the assistance that you need to set these things up. So it's a bit disjointed. And so I definitely think there needs to be more organization on this kind of level. There's also a very exciting organic waste landfill ban coming up. Um, a restriction on organic waste being landfill by 50% by 2022 and 100% by 2027. So each or a municipality in the Western Cape needs to draw up an organic waste diversion plan. And a lot of municipalities haven't even started drawing up the plan, um, even though the deadline is looming very soon next year. So I think the public needs to be more aware that they are going to be required to have compulsory soil separation of all the organic waste streams so they can be processed and returned to the soil where it belongs. So compost regenerates the soil and prevents climate change and helps us grow a lot of food for ourselves. So if you are interested in more information, I've put a few websites here to go and have a look at. Um, the Soil Food Web is excellent on how um, compost can build our soils uh, to make healthy soil for growing food. Um, YouTube, um, just Google Elaine Ingham, she has lots of information on soil health. And the Rodell Institute is a um, organic farming organization in America lots of information on composting and organic farming. And then um, ILSR.org is the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. That's where I got all of these documents from. There's a lot of more information on community composters there. If you're interested also, there's a new way of doing composting with vertical aeration pipes. It's called the Johnson Su Bioreactor. You can find a link on YouTube for how to set it up. And then also please go and have a look at biocycle.net. It is a publication for the US Compost Council. Lots of articles on all kinds of organic waste recycling and, and processing systems. So definitely go and have a look there. So thanks very much for listening. Um, you're welcome to contact me at info at or give me a call. Um, we're happy to help you with um, setting things up and expanding composting. So please, can we go ahead? We can answer some questions. If people have questions, we can have a look at them in the chat. I'll go to the chat now and see what we have there. Thanks so much. Okay, let me have a look. Wow. Um, can I, can I, that's, that's so much to us. Can I, can I start? <laughs> you can start. Hello, Kelson. You're from yes, Scarborough. That's hey. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, not sure. We've been composting for, for a while now so oh gosh you know there's so many things it was amazing presentation really really appreciate that uh regarding the city you know how how governments can get involved i mean geez, if they could give us a rebate you know on the on the rates you know for people that's uh, uh composting or i don't know you know we you know we set up a solar panel in the house you get penalized you put in uh, water tanks you get penalized if we you know we have i mean we compost everything from home my neighbors Got a three, four, five bag, a black bag, and we pay exactly the same uh, rates so or yeah. refused rates, or whatever. So I think if they could have just give us a rebate, then you see a lot of people jump into that. So they don't have yeah. to do much, just uh, look into that. Yeah. Uh, other question regarding the, the methodology, and it's amazing uh, the way you put together, it looks very, very sweet. But uh, I think when we, you know, when we add the humans. You know, when you add the human in the equation, then the wheels come off, you know? So it's very important to keep in mind that. 
uh, what we learned from our side here, just try very, start very small, you know, try maybe a small like pilot project, you know, something, uh, I don't know, we started with like a thousand liters and now we're like in the 30,000 liters compost uh, uh, containers. So, but we learn as we go. So it's, it's almost like a process. It's uh, um, you grow organically, you know? And then uh, just a quick one, the last one regarding uh, um, volunteers. I think they're great. It works like a charm in the beginning, but eventually everybody's kind of aware, of, you know, it's a quite a hard work, especially when dealing with compost, it's a lot of labor intensive work. So eventually we have to employ someone in a full time to deal with the stuff. And uh, the challenge is to, to, to look into the whole thing and to find a way, you know, to, to create uh, uh, funds, you know, to generate funds to support uh, um, someone or uh, some, some work out there. And there's a lot of people in South Africa that's really, really need that job. And uh, the last thing you just said, Garden Compo, there's such an incredible opportunity now um, for, for a small business, for a young entrepreneur to jump in this, in this opportunity. You know, waste management is a new thing. It's, it's uh, please, and if anyone just listen to the thing and just go for it, there's such an incredible opportunity out there. Cool. Thanks very much. I really appreciate it. It was awesome. Thanks so much. Okay. Let me just uh, find some questions here on the side here. Okay. Just start. Okay. So, yeah, we will be um, putting out the presentation at those who want it. So, um, that's no problem to get the presentation for you. Um, Compost temperature probes, yes, you can buy them from Cape Instruments, they're in Pardon Island, um, if you email me, they will actually make up probes, you can have them half a meter, up to a meter and a half, depending on your size of your heaps, you can have them made up, that's not a problem. Um, I have a question from Naomi. Um, the green brown ratio, normally we want more brown than green. So you want twice to three times as much brown to green. So two to two or three to one uh, ratios on your on your mix that you're going to make. Um, so that's that's quite important. If you've got too much food waste, then it does tend to get too wet and, and can get very soggy and anaerobic. So that's important. Okay. Oh, tea bag, the tea bag question. Nicholas has a question about the tea bags. Um, I have looked at certain types of tea bags. Um, it seems that Lipton's tea bags are full of plastic. You can't compost them at all. Um, other tea bags, I don't seem to find that there are any residues from those tea bags. So I definitely find that you, if you tear the tea bag, you can actually tell whether there's plastic or not. If it's easy to tear, there's no plastic in it. Um, but I, I do still um, compost tea bags, but not Lipton tea bags at all. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Okay, Eric is asking about compost. Okay, so composting on concrete helps a lot in the winter time and helps you also move concrete because um, move the compost. So if you have it on soil, you actually incorporate a lot of soil into the material. If you're trying to make a pure compost, it's actually difficult to end up more with a potting soil because it's got soil from underneath. And if you've got stony soil or um, gravel, then that can be all incorporated into, into the compost. So you can make a much better compost product on concrete. And if you're using very wet materials, it's nice to have concrete as a barrier so that you're not going to have any leachate coming down into your soil. And then it's very easy to put sawdust around the edges of the concrete to soak up any liquids. So um, I do. I would prefer to do it on concrete. I don't have that luxury at my composting site. We are on 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 soil. So um, definitely, when it's raining, you want to have something that's that's firm. And then access to your site. You know, if you've got vehicles or wheelbarrows, then a proper surface is very helpful. Um, Covered compost heaps that do not land up on fire. So the heat in compost is often determined by the size of your compost heap. So making sure your compost heaps are not too high. So I'd say two meters, three meters is about max. Um, your your compost heap shouldn't shouldn't come, go on, you know, have spontaneous combustion. 
Um, there's certain circumstances where it happened, where there's um, dry material put in and it hasn't been aerated or, or managed properly. But I don't think for a small scale, a fire really is, 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 a, is a something to worry about. Okay, okay, Niam is asking about South African example. Okay, so really good composting examples. We have Soil for Life in Constantia, they do some composting there, um, as well as Seed. Seed are at Rockland Primary School in Mitchell's Plain. They do quite a lot of vermin composting and they also have a, a food waste composting uh, system. These are non-profit organizations that have been going for quite a long time and they do have composting along with the urban garden training. So they are um, very experienced in those kind of um, things. So those are definitely local examples that you can look at. And I think there are quite a few people on the call that are doing it uh, down in Scarborough and in Colt Bay that could also, um, if you are interested in going to have a look, you could, you could ask them. Okay. Okay, Jill's asking about keeping food in buckets for too long. Um, just stick it in the pile and cover it with some mature compost. Not a problem. Just put it in there, it's like you would anything. It's it's rotting. I, I don't see a problem. It probably just smells a bit. Just stick some compost on and control those odors. And um, if you're worried, you can put a bit of gash, bokashi in the bucket, or you can use sawdust. But um, the length of time doesn't bother me. Um, Bill, I don't know if you want to maybe say something about your experience of food that's been kept in buckets too long? I'm just uh, considering, um, uh, thank you for the answer, by the way. Um, I'm considering uh, offering it to my neighbours and I'm just wondering, you know, if they aren't diligent about doing, you know, coming frequently and I might end up with some disgusting mouldy mess to deal with. <laughs> um, but if you reckon I can just chuck it in the pile and it'll be fine. Um, yeah, I'll give that a go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'll put a pig on your nose. I think that's the only thing I can advise. Um, what's very interesting with the bucket system, if the um, you might find that might freak people out a bit is that if the, the bucket in the kitchen had access to the flies had access to it, they could have laid eggs and then you could have had maggots. But once you put it in a bucket, lack of oxygen kills all the maggots. So, but you will see evidence of that. So it's always good just to warn people about that. And then also in the bucket, if you cover it with newspaper or um, sawdust, it actually just creates better visual. Uh, thing for when people are adding more material to that bucket. I mean, most 25 litre buckets that you getting for for composting can last three to four weeks quite easily without causing too much problems. And I think, you know, Bokashi is, is also very effective. It also helps to reduce any gas build up in the bucket. Um, but I also use sawdust and newspaper to cover the layers inside the bucket. That's great. Thank you. May I just add another question? Similar, uh, rats. Um, do you have a problem with rats or, or you know, how do you deal with them? Okay, so rats are looking for places to nest and also food to eat. So you want to make sure you keep the area around the compost bins very clear. So you want to have about three feet between a wall and a composter. So that is an open space so that the rats feel it very exposed. If you put your compost heaps right in the corner, they'll have this lovely private opportunity to climb into the compost. So if you're getting active heats going very hot, very quickly, then there's less food waste available to them. Um, rats are very tenacious. Um, I would always recommend um, humane traps or um, there is another method of uh, rat trapping is called a rat zapper. So there's no poisons involved. Definitely don't use poisons for rats um, because we don't want to kill any, any, any wildlife. Um, but uh, rats need to be controlled and they are going to be an issue in certain areas. Um, I definitely find in Claremont, that's where I am, that rats are definitely an issue when it comes to compost heaps. Um, the main thing is if you've got bin systems put them on concrete so that they can't burrow underneath, to get into the composters, um, that's very good. But rats will chew through lots of different types of plastic composters. Um, and even through wood. So little mesh even might be the only way to keep them out of your compost heap. But yeah, active vigilance and careful 
complaining and making sure there's no food waste available or visible for them to, to get into. Thanks very much. Thanks. Okay. So Eric has just put onto the chat about um, the Cape Town Together Food Grows initiative. Um, they've been doing quite a few of these events uh, around composting to educate people. So yeah, go and have a look at their YouTube channel as well. Um, so Wayne's talking about the Share Waste app. I don't know about that. Wayne, do you want to tell us about the Share Waste app? Uh, yeah, it's just something that I've come across. Um, it's, it's basically an international app that's designed to basically connect small composting operations with local people that want to. Um, it's, it's quite clever in that you can actually specify what you're willing to take. Um, so it's trying to connect composters with a source of, of raw materials. I see Kelson says that Scarborough is on there. Okay, so that's something that we could possibly look at doing. Um, but we need to yeah, get that out to social media so people can know where to take the waste. So um, we can do that. I just yeah, wanted to also... We are building a network. Yeah, okay, awesome. Thanks Thanks for that, Wayne. That's great. Um, I just also wanted to mention that the City of Cape Town is doing a pilot study on um, their drop-offs. They have recycling drop-offs. They are now accepting food waste at four of their drop-off sites, and then they've got four pop-up drop-offs, which are based on a New York City approach where there's a temporary table that's set up where people can bring the food waste at particular times during the week. Um, so that trial has been going for two months now, and um, they've recently opened up to more residents. I think they've They've only composted about a ton and a half of material, but um, it's definitely a start with the city uh, acknowledging that food waste is important. And I see Rian's just asking about the home composting initiative. So the city has handed out over 22,000 home composters. These were green genies. They were 150 litres for backyard composting. I'm not too sure if they're doing another um, rollout of that. At the stage, the person to speak is Noel Johansson from the City of Cape Town. Um, but um, normally, you've got to just go to their website or look on Facebook to see when they're doing those. Um, I'm not aware of any at the moment. They're handing that; they were only handing them out in certain areas. Okay. Um, Naomi, do you want to say which, which trials you'd be referring to? The City of Cape Town's trials, Naomi? Okay, so the City of Cape Town's ones were at four sites. I will have to um, find the, um, just have to find the link to that. I can just quickly find it again and um, I can just post that quickly. Um, I'll quickly just look for that, for the, the drop of the city. Um, do we have any other uh, questions? Any other questions? Um, uh, can everybody access those documents? I uh, see Eric is asking about joining Arasa. Okay. Um, Yes, yeah, so RASA is an industry body for, for um, businesses. So we do have um, our membership is a thousand rand per year for individuals and uh, communities and small businesses, and then three thousand rand for large businesses with a turnover over ten million rand. So we do have those two categories. Um, so we have a website where all our um, our members' details are listed, and then we also host events. Um, we've also been involved with um, the new norms and standards for composting, the legislation around the extended producer responsibility for um, compostable packaging, um, and um, also with these new organic waste diversion plans. So we are active as an organization in um, legislation and with government. Um, if you need help with the government, we do know who the right people to talk to are that could potentially help you. So, um, yeah, um, definitely we'd love to see more community composting and we feel that 
it's a way to build jobs and new businesses and um, grow the, the organics recycling industry and see much more organic waste diverted from landfill and end up in the um, um, in, in back in the soil, not in the landfill. So yeah, so um, I'm just going to post that um, City of Cape Town. Emil, do you have it or shall I find it? Uh, yeah, I'm just finished typing it up quickly. Uh, one more. Yeah, they've had some yeah, information more. on Cape Talk as well. So yeah, there's a website too. Uh, hi, can I come in quick uh, just regarding, um, yeah, uh, community compost look. What we learn from our side is well, the, you know, try to keep very simple. What I mean, simple when you collect, uh, uh, you know, what residents to drop off your compost. If you start to tell them, ah, you know, no, no eggshell, no seafood, no this, no that. So the things get gets quite complicated, you know. So we, whatever system that you you choose to implement, just uh, keep in mind that um, keep very simple, not just almost like. We try to say to everybody, it's like anything that's compostable goes in the bucket, and then uh, people have no no doubt that they just do it. You know, cool. Yes, changing things confuses people, so yes, correct. It can yeah. you can't change your mind later almost to what what can go in the bucket and what can't go out of the bucket. Yeah. Tell me, Pelsa, what kind of tonnages are you busy composting at the moment? Can you give me an idea of what? Um, that yeah. Is? We had a, a, a quick estimation. I, I think we probably around like a maybe one ton a month, 1.5 ton a month. And that's just the kitchen waste. And I'll say about um, yeah, also close to that with the uh, dog poo waste. So so yeah, we're looking around two tons of, of waste. And the, and the garden waste you're not weighing, you're not managing, you're not measuring that mm. at all. No, no. we. You know, it's just like a, like a shortage of, of volunteers you not know, to do that kind of work but okay. eventually i think that's the plan to start to really yeah take notes and but yeah it's uh, the garden waste being a, a little bit of an issue in the beginning because a lot of people's dropping off uh, used to drop a lot of like branches and we couldn't process that we don't have a chipper mm -hmm. and uh, so now we just uh, we're just asking for um like leaves or grass cuttings and um but i uh, would love to have like a machine like a proper chipper that can deal with that and then we can collect all the garden waste you know okay. but yeah uh, it's a long it's a process so we we, we we're growing you know and uh, i think a couple years from now we we're definitely gonna also collect the, the garden waste and and hopefully all the kitchen waste that produces scarborough okay and what are you charging for your service uh, it's a free, uh, if the people uh, choose to drop off uh, at, at our area, at the biodynamic center, is a free of charge. So they, we provide the back, we provide everything really. Um, and if they like to have the convenience or so to be collect home, then uh, we have a young man called Bob from Malawi. So he, he goes and collects once a week and then I drop an empty bucket, they collect a full bucket. And I think it's charged something like 70 rands per month for the service. So yeah, so it's okay. really, really cool little startup business there for him. Yeah. Just on the city of the Cape Town's fees for the rates where you have pay for your, your waste collection, I think it's 137 rand a month, the That's city right, of Cape Town. Yeah. There's no ways they can take that away. That is built into the structure of the city's bylaws. So there's no way of rewarding people necessarily with that. And the city actually has a problem where they don't have enough funding because they're not collecting enough rates. So they have put in the city of Cape Town's drop-offs as, as a service as a for us um, to take our garden waste to them um, and then they process it. So those are free recycling services that they provide. But there's no ways within their bylaws for them to take that off your, your monthly rate, your waste bill. So I don't put my waste, my, I put my, my wheelie bin out about every eight weeks and I take my recycling to the drop off and I compost my food and garden waste. So I'm still using a city of Cape Town service by using their drop off, even though I don't have my waste collected every week. So it is a problem that there's no incentives to do the composting. 
And um, yeah, so it is it's frustrating because other countries have amazing systems where you get rewarded for your efforts and so we yeah. just don't. No, for sure. Look, most of us that's doing, you know, is doing because, you know, we're just doing because the morally right thing to do and feel good. And I mean, it's all the other aspects, really. But um, yeah, I think there's a lot of people there uh, that will be motivated to do if there's some kind of uh, finance reward, you know. Unfortunately, yeah. that's the way it works. They're not just going to do because um, it's the right thing to do. So I think the seed could really, really play play ball here. I mean, there's many seeds in the world that are doing that. I mean, there's some places that they they get a they get a rebate just by the amount of trees that you have in your garden, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And um, yeah, but it's unfortunately here it's just complete opposite. You know, you just get uh, penalized all the time that you do the yeah. right thing. So yeah, it's a long way. Um, I think they they got so much more to gain if they was doing. Uh, rewarding people for for composting, for having solar panels, to rainwater tanks, you know, and uh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, case. I think I think I think with the new landfill ban, the law will require the source separation and the processing of organic waste into into compost. Like, so, I think maybe it won't be incentives; it will be the law that will require it. So there is is hope on the rise, and that there is change going to have to come in that in that source separation will need to happen. Thanks so much. Um, Thank I've just you. got a couple more um, questions from uh, one from Monique about the curing. So if you're going to leave your compost to cure, you normally put it under some plastic sheeting in a heap to cure it, or you can put it into um, a bin that's got some holes in it to, just to, to keep it curated. Um, definitely, the longer they leave it, the more um, microbes will actually grow and you get actually more diversity of, of, of fungal growth and, and bacterial and protozoal growth in compost if you allow it to cure. So your quality of your compost is much higher. Um, it's not necessary, but you can actually just also dig it into the soil and or, or put it into a trench if you if you haven't got space to cure it. So that is an is another op option for um storing it. Um, Eric is asking about biodigesters. I've built a couple of biodigesters. They're not very easy to manage, um, and it all looks very cool on the on the diagram. Um, it takes quite a long time to get any methane burning out of your Bunsen burner. Um, but yeah, I'm not aware of any small scale ones. There are definitely um, um, happening in Elgin and um, the Elgin fruit juice have a very large anaerobic digester. The one in Athlone is another large scale one that's actually closed. Um, but there are lots of plans for anaerobic digesters that are on the internet using um, 140 liter drums um, or other containers to make it. Um, I personally don't know anyone who's doing it at the right now. And then Best practices for humanure. Um, compost toilets, there's a lot of information. My favorite is a company called, uh, it's, well, it's an organization in Haiti and it's called Soil. They do um, lots of, uh, they provide a service to the informal areas in Haiti where they provide um, um, toilets with a sawdust system where they collect urine and feces and they compost it. Um, I will a link onto their website if you're interested in how they go about doing human manure. So um, let me just find that and I can just put it on. Have we got any more questions? Is everybody going, going to go and read my um, document? You have to commit to, to doing it. Because I think the information is out there and um, you can just access it and, and implement it. Just try new things. Um, and you'll see you can compost pretty much anything that used to be alive. Okay, Erica, there's the link to Soil in Haiti, which does um, yeah, composting of the human waste. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Melanie. Um, uh, I've got one more question on the human um, year. We're yes. talking about an urban setting here, the city of Cape yeah. Town, with most of the people are on the pill or taking statins or antidepressants. Uh, and those sort of things don't break down in a normal composting process. So 
How would you handle human manure in, in, in that context? I think the question is, is that are those materials going to affect the plants that grow inside the, in the um, in the soil that's had the compost added? Um, the only one that I've seen that's been the biggest issue is PFAs, uh, which are fluorines. I don't think the studies have been done on drugs. Um, the biggest university in America that um, does studies on all of these things, um, you'd actually probably have to go and find some scientific publications to, to find out what those levels are. In my mind, bacteria can cut most molecules up into their basic um, basic molecules um, or individual atoms. So uh, I do think that there would need to be studies on, on what the levels are that would remain of these drugs in, in our soils. It all comes down to will the plant absorb that and then affect the person or the human that's eating it. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, so maybe any academics on, on the call will that <laughs> listen to this in future. <laughs> Yeah, something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. I know that um, we do composting of animal mortalities and Cornell University has proven that anti-inflammatories as well as uh, euthanase is actually broken down and is, is, there's no residual action, um, remaining in soils. It's broken down by the bacteria. The molecules are cut up by the bacteria. So there's no residue in that. That's Cornell University study. Okay, John wants to know about John wants to know ash. Ash should be fine to go into the briar. It can change the pH slightly, but as long as you don't put too much in it, it can all go in into your compost. Okay, are we almost out of time? Uh, thanks everybody for your questions. Um, I hope you all um, benefited from um, this webinar and uh, go out and do some. Um, some composting of your own and um, yeah, we hope to have the City of Cape Town in, um, supporting more urban farms and community gardens so that we can see more organic waste diverted from landfill. Thanks so much and uh, please have a look at our website at www.orasa.org.za um, more about Orasa and thank you very much to um, Erica from uh, Cape Town Together Food Growers Initiative um, all your, all your wonderful webinars this week in celebration of International Compost Awareness Week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Emil. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank bye, you. Bye. Well done, Mel. That was brilliant. Thanks, Emil. Great attendance as well. Yeah, no, it's nice. Have, like over, over 20 odd people there. Quite yeah. Good. Yeah. No, we want to see more of the community composting coming up. And I think if the city sees that it's beneficial, that can go 